Last episode we talked about the transformation of Isengard and we will continue this topic today, looking a bit at Saruman's intentions and also shortly speak about a very complex topic, Orcs and their law. It would go beyond the scope to discuss this in detail, so I will only give you a basic overview why the Orcs law is so problematic in Tolkien's universe. We also left the order of the films a bit, but I think it makes sense this way. As always I will try to pronounce names as Tolkien described it, shoutouts to Kimberly80 for allowing me to use her amazing art and spoiler warning. In the Isengard or Isengard section of the Fellowship of the Ring film we see how drastically this place changed while Gandalf was imprisoned on top of Orthanc. It is not clear how much time passes in the films but it could be a while and it's in my opinion implied that what the Hobbits and Strider experience happens in parallel by cross-cutting the parts. But as mentioned last episode it did not happen in parallel and we know exactly how long Gandalf was there. It was for two months and a week. Now it seems still strange that we see all those pits which are mentioned in the books too after such a short time and that Saruman seems to raise an army so fast but there is more to it from the book's perspective. Saruman used the Palantir and allied with Sauron around 3rd age 3000, so 18 years prior to the Lord of the Rings. He of course had already his own agenda at this time or let's say Sauron brought him on this track but in a best case scenario he would find the One Ring first and bring his vision of order over Middle Earth, pretty much like Sauron, so he did not want to be a puppet of him. What is really interesting, in the Unfinished Tales we can read that Saruman started to breed orcs in secret around 3rd age 2990, so even before he allied with Sauron. This explains where the orcs were coming from, not out of thin air, but he prepared the army over a time span of 28 years in secret. In Appendix A we also find a reference of them raiding and stealing horses in the surrounding eastern regions, which was noticed by Rohan, but nobody knew the source of the attacks by the Urukai. The White Withered also allied with the Dune landings at some point, which we later only see in the extended edition, but those men also were a big part of his forces in the books. In Appendix B it is described that Saruman withdrew from Isengard and fortified it 3rd age 2953, so here the process of isolating himself already began and all this time is enough to build an army. The books also made it clearer that he was not just following Sauron as an ally but that he betrays him very soon following his own plans to rule over Middle Earth. A dangerous game and he was fully aware of it and its consequences. Gandalf answers to Saruman in the books when the White Wizard suggested an alliance with him to rule over Middle Earth. Saruman, I said, standing away from him, only one hand at a time can wield the one and you know that well, so do not trouble to say we. In the film we find a somewhat related quote shortly before Gandalf escapes from Isengard with the help of the great eagle Gwaihir. Saruman also says it would be wise in the book, which is one of my favorite phrases. So the White Wizard prepared all this a long time and planned to betray his ally Sauron, who was interestingly aware of his betrayal quite early. Now as we discussed last episode, Gandalf comments on where is it had once been green and fair, it was now filled with pits and forges. He said this during his imprisonment. I always interpreted that the final reveal of the secrets Saruman was tinkering on happened in these two months, while before it all happened in secret in caverns under Isengard, unseen by the outer world. Some people interpret it differently though, which makes sense too. Arguments would be that it was night when Gandalf arrived and he could not see the changes from outside or in the dark, but when he was captured at the top of Orthanc he could see it. As mentioned I prefer a different view. It is described that Gandalf had a strange feeling entering and it seems he was a bit skeptical. If he had noticed any ill intent in Radagath he would not have gone, which implies that their relationship was probably not the best after Saruman delayed the White Council for so long. He of course hasn't visited Saruman in many decades, but I think the smoke of forges that do not fit in a green and fair place would be visible and also smell 
smellable. It's hard to believe that nobody noticed the change, be it birds of Radagast, the great eagles or even people travelling through the gap of Rohan. We heard about people fleeing from the south and Gandalf talking to wanderers before he met Radagast in one of the last episodes. He even talked to the brown withered himself and I think the great eagles or other animal allies would have warned them if they would have noticed such strange behaviour of the white withered and forges running day and night in Isengard. So drastically changing this place, forging armor and weapons for probably 10,000 orcs and especially sending Radagast to find Gandalf, which could mean he met Saruman, should have been noticed by at least someone, even when Isengard was pretty isolated for decades. So from my perspective, Gandalf's captivity was reason for Saruman to finally reveal what he was doing and he started, so to say, the final phase. Now pits and forges were not hidden anymore and they could take, for example, surrounding wood. The book Unfinished Tales in the chapter The Hunt for the Ring also gives us some more details about what happened in the background from the perspective of the Nazgul, which includes visiting Saruman. These details missed completely in the films and also did not make it into the Lord of the Rings book itself. It seems the Nazgul first tried to find hobbits and the Shire. Gollum could escape from the Sylvan Elves of Thranduil because orcs attacked there to free him. We briefly talked about this in episode 12. However, Gollum also escaped from the orcs who freed him and they could not ask him where to go. So the ring wraiths seemed to visit the Vales of Anduin, where the Stur hobbits, Gollum was one of them, once settled searching the One Ring, but the villages had of course long been abandoned. What I forgot to mention, the Nazgul also split up 67 years before. Three of them, including Kamul, reoccupied Dol Guldur in that time. So when the others were in that region 67 years later, they all met. They then continued seeking north to find the Shire. They speculated it being close to Lothlorien, but they did not dare to enter it. Of course, they couldn't find it there and after probably several weeks, they returned to Mordor, passing through the Wald, the northern part of Rohan, where they met messengers from Barad-dûr, who told them about Boromir and the prophecy heard in Gondor. We will talk about this in a future episode. But also Saruman's deeds and that Gandalf was captured in Isengard. This is a really interesting detail, especially that Sauron knew about all this. So now black riders travel to visit Saruman. During all these events and Sauron attacking Osgiliath and fighting with Gondor even before that, people fled into the north and rumors of the black shadow spread. I think this makes this part of the last episodes clearer. For example, how Gandalf learned from people fleeing from the south and Radagast about the black riders. The process took a while and the ring wraith searched for the one ring in the north for about two months including travelling times. Also Dol Guldur was occupied again about 67 years ago and with it Sauron had an outpost in that region that probably spread fear there too. The confrontation with Saruman is also interesting. When the Nazgul reached the ring of Isengard, Saruman spoke to them magically, like his voice was coming from the gate. It resembles a bit Gandalf entering Isengard in the film, where we first only hear Christopher Lee's amazing voice like a narrator. The riders could not enter Isengard without an army and siege worms. Also Saruman's voice had power and he magically convinced them to let go and and search for Gandalf nearby and that he did not know where the land they were searching for is located, which of course was not true. He knew exactly where the Shire was. He also said that if he would have the One Ring, they would bow before him. The Black Riders magically believed him, if it was true or not what he said and searched in Rohan for Gandalf. But how did they learn where the Shire was? Another figure that appears much later in the films told them. Grima Wormtang was on his way to Isengard from Edoras, but sadly the poor guy ran into the Black Riders. He was scared to death and told them everything and the riders let him go. They knew he would not tell Saruman. And with this they learned where the Shire was and rode straight to it. And two days later four Black Riders entered it. The others were busy with the Dunedain rangers guarding the area. Some of them were slain by the Nazgul in their duty to guard the Shire. 
Shire. You see how all those little chess pieces were brought in place and how all this delayed them just long enough that Frodo could escape just in time. In the meantime Gandalf tamed Shadowfax in Rohan and was on his way to the Shire. He did not meet the Nazgul until he reached Bree. Another detail. They also met two of Saruman's spies on their way. One of them had shards of the Shire with him because he was used in this area. They also sent him to Bree to spy further but now for them and not Saruman. I assume he is a squint-eyed thousander. All these details about the Nazgul's movement can be found in the chapter The Hunt for the Ring of the Unfinished Tales where Christopher Tolkien published many notes and texts of his father that were probably never intended to be published in this form. They make sense but were not included in the books and the timeline of them can feel a bit off in some places but maybe that's just me. Consider that canon is always a huge field of debate when it comes to books outside of of the Lord of the Rings itself and maybe the Hobbit. I also made a video about canon in case you are interested. With this we know what happened in the background. If we now come back to Saruman we see in the films how he breeds orcs. After the moth scene we see the camera flying down into the orc pits. We see how the orc smiths forge weapons and armor in large quantity. We also see the mentioned fake tree just from another angle and it then falling down the pits to fuel the forges. For this they used a specially prepared tree if I understood it correctly so it would behave naturally on impact. The scenes show that there are some kind of logistics going on and how effective the orcs are at creating a large army and equipment in a short period of time. Now we come to a topic that is really complex and I will only cover it briefly in this episode. I assume we will revisit it later in this series again. Orcs. We see the birth of orcs or Uruk Hai. Uruk is black speech and means orc and Hai probably means people. Law wise Uruk Hai first appeared in Sauron's forces of Minas Morgul about 500 years prior when they attacked Gondor and destroyed Osgiliath, turning the area into disputed territory, at least the east side of the river. Osgiliath had also lost its status as capital of Gondor far before that. So the Urukai are not an invention of Saruman and Sauron already used this orc breed centuries before. The law of the orcs itself is what makes this a complicated topic because Tolkien changed his mind multiple times on their origin and also never finished the work on his last idea. The only origin story that is somewhat compatible with the law and especially the Silmarillion as we know it today is that orcs once were elves who were captured tortured and corrupted by Sauron's master Morgoth or Melkor as he was still called at this time. We can read they were transformed to mock the creation of the elves. Interestingly some other creatures were transformed into trolls by Melkor to mock the creation of the ants. Some of the Avari elves, some also call them dark elves or the refusers and other poor elves captured by Melkor were very early candidates for the origin of orcs. However Tolkien's last idea for the origin was that orcs were transformed men. You may ask why is that a problem? In the law orcs appear the first time about 3500 years before men existed. So to change this Tolkien needed to move the awakening of men 3500 years into the past and you can probably imagine that this results in a lot of work and problems. There are some people who say that Tolkien already solved most of them but in my opinion that is only true to some degree. The tale of Ardanel and the dialogue between Andres and Finrod are a great start but in my opinion it still needs more than that. The origin story of orcs also has so many different versions that it can be confusing. We come to this in a moment. So without changing the law of men only spirit beings, ants, dwarfs and elves are left as origin for orcs. Now you could ask why orcs can't be a creation of Melkor. 
In Tolkien's law, the Valar, the High Angels, can't create intelligent life. They can create something like puppets, which is the origin story of the dwarves, who then got a spirit from Eru, that is God, and became self-aware and sentient. But the High Angels can't create intelligent, sentient life themselves. Only Eru can do this, with an ability or concept called the secret fire or flame imperishable. Gandalf, for example, references this when he confronts the Balrog in Moria. So the Valar Melkor can't just create create orcs out of nothing. He can only take existing beings and change or transform them into something else like orcs. And this is the core problem for this option. A problem for the elf origin is that elves are very powerful beings and orcs do not have their power and purity. In addition, altering the body of elves creates problems with their spirits. So taking elves as origin has its problems too. That's why the Silmarillion phrases it very carefully, quote, yet this is held true by the wise of Eresia. It's not a very definitive statement. But if orcs are elves who reproduce like men do, why do they come out of slimy pits in the film? This is of course not in the main books. However, here we are at another idea of Tolkien. In very early drafts of the author, orcs came indeed out of slime pits. Quote from the Book of Lost Tales part 2, all that race were bred from the subterranean heats and slime. But Tolkien probably stumbled upon the problem we just discussed, disliking the idea that another entity besides God could create sentient life. And so this was abandoned. However, I think it's referenced in the film and probably one of the only ways to visualize and explain the creation of orcs in a film. It also makes the rabbit creation quite mysterious and one has to admit, the origin of the orcs is also a mystery in the books. There are more details and we will talk about them in later episodes. For completion's sake, the term goblin is often used synonymously. In the Hobbit book, the term goblin is exclusively used and orc does not appear at all, only in the name Orkrist, the sword Thorin Oakenshield found. In the Lord of the Rings, the term goblin is used far less and they are mostly called orcs or uruks. Interestingly, we find half orcs and half goblins mentioned in the same sentence, which implies a difference, but this is the only instance. We will discuss this in later episodes. In the film we also see a huge Urukai who becomes a leader of the forces of Saruman called Lourdes. He is not in the books and was an invention of Peter Jackson and his team to have another physically present villain in the film which is needed in a visual medium. Could be based on Ugluk, but he is in the films too. Orlando Bloom comments that the first thing he does is kill as he kills another orc right after he is born. I think it's a great scene and Christopher Lee's expression fits so well. He created a monster you could say and I like the idea considering Lee's connection to Frankenstein. Urukai are described as black orcs of great strength and in the index of the unfinished tales it is also mentioned that they had great size. They were the soldier orcs and looked down at the lesser breeds calling them snaga which means slave. For poor actor Lawrence Macquarie, who played Lourdes and later Gothmog and the Witch King in Return of the King, it took 11 hours to get his prosthetics and makeup on when he had to be in full costume. And then they started shooting. So he needed to be there at 10 or 11 pm the day before so he could be ready to film next morning. Hard to imagine and it shows the dedication he and the crew had to create these films that also aged really well because of all those practical effects. There is much more to explore but this has to wait until next episode. Thank you for watching. It took me a bit longer to finish this episode. I was lost in some details like the path of the Nazgul and rewrote many parts of the text. In addition, I had too much fun playing Jedi Fallen Order on stream and also I did some research on the consequences of the whole Children's Online Privacy Protection Act short copper on YouTube and especially my channel, which ate some time too. I'm relatively confident that the law itself won't affect my channel because my analytical approach to the source material 
material is not directed at children at all. And most of my viewers are above 18, like over 99.2% of them, which reflects this quite well. Still, it's YouTube's implementation of yet another automated system that will check all videos worrying me a bit. I will keep you up to date, but there seems to be no reason to panic, at least for me. But creators who make content for children are potentially screwed by that. In case you are still listening, feel free to press the like button, leave a comment or check my other lore videos. I'll link playlists for this series and my recommended videos in the description too. In case you want to subscribe, consider pressing the annoying bell too. I potentially make some gaming related content next or soon, but of course Tolkien's law is always on my mind and this series will take a while to complete, so more episodes will be released for sure. I also stream my playthrough of Jedi Fallen Order on the highest difficulty on Twitch if you are interested. Also feel free to join my Discord server. Again, thank you for watching and goodbye.